Hello, back to Luke. Luke chapter 19. Luke 19. This is New Testament video 218, Luke lesson 61. Luke chapter 19. Luke 19, verse 28. Father God, we ask that you bless this time of study. And we give you all the praise, the glory, and the honor that you alone deserve. Thank you. In Christ's name, amen. Luke 19. Luke 19. Verse 28. And when he had thus spoken, he went before, ascending up to Jerusalem. And it came to pass when he was come nigh to Bethphage and Bethany at the mount called the Mount of Olives, he sent two of his disciples, saying, Go ye into the village over against you, in the which at your entering ye shall find a colt tied, whereon yet never man sat. Loose him, and bring him hither. And if any man ask you, Why do ye loose him? Thus shall ye say unto him, Because the Lord hath need of him. And they that were sent went their way, and found even as he had said unto them. And as they were loosing the colt, the owners thereof said unto them, Why loose ye the colt? And they said, The Lord hath need of him. And they brought him to Jesus. And they cast their garments upon the colt, and they set Jesus thereon. And as he went, they spread their clothes in the way. And when he was come nigh, even now at the descent of the Mount of Olives, the whole multitude of the disciples began to rejoice and praise God with a loud voice for all the mighty works that they had seen, saying, Blessed be the King that cometh in the name of the Lord, peace in heaven and glory in the highest. And some of the Pharisees from the multitude said unto him, Master, rebuke thy disciples. And he answered and said unto them, I tell you that if these should hold their peace, the stones would immediately cry out. This is often called the triumphal entry. A better term is Palm Sunday entry. I'll explain why that is a better title later in this lesson. Come back to Matthew. Turn to Matthew. 21, Matthew 21, verse 1. And when they drew nigh unto Jerusalem, and were come to Bethphage, unto the Mount of Olives, then sent Jesus two disciples, saying unto them, Go into the village over against you, and straightway ye shall find an ass tied, and a colt with her. Loose them, and bring them unto me. And if any say aught unto you, ye shall say, The Lord hath need of them, and straightway he will send them. All this was done, that it might be fulfilled, which was spoken by the prophet, saying, Tell ye the daughter of Zion, Behold, thy king cometh unto thee, meek and sitting upon an ass, and a colt the foal of an ass. And the disciples went and did as Jesus commanded them, and brought the ass and the colt, and put on them their clothes. And they set him thereon, and a very great multitude spread their garments in the way. Others cut down branches from the trees, and strawed them in the way. And the multitudes that went before and that followed cried, saying, Hosanna to the Son of David! Blessed is he that cometh in the name of the Lord! Hosanna in the highest! And when he was coming to Jerusalem, all the city was moved, saying, Who is this? And the multitude said, This is Jesus, the prophet of Nazareth of Galilee. That's Matthew. Now to Mark. 
come over to Mark chapter 11. Mark's version. Mark chapter 11. 11. Verse 1. And when they came nigh to Jerusalem unto Bethphage and Bethany at the Mount of Olives, he sendeth forth two of his disciples and saith unto them, Go your way into the village over against you. And as soon as ye be entered into it, ye shall find a colt tied, whereon never man sat. Loose him and bring him. And if any man say unto you, Why do ye this? Say ye that the Lord hath need of him, and straightway he will send him hither. And they went their way, and found the colt tied by the door without, and a place where two ways met, and they loose him. And certain of them that stood there said unto them, what do ye, loosing the colt? And they said unto them, Even as Jesus had commanded, and they let them go. And they brought the colt to Jesus, and cast their garments on him, and he sat upon him. And many spread their garments in the way, and others cut down branches off the trees, and straw them in the way. And they that went before, and they that followed, cried, saying, Hosanna! Blessed is he that cometh in the name of the Lord. Blessed be the kingdom of our father David that cometh in the name of the Lord. Hosanna in the highest. Then Jesus entered into Jerusalem and into the temple. And when he had looked round upon all things, and now the eventide was come, and he went out unto Bethany with the twelve. John. Go over to John. John 12, John 12, verse 12. On the next day, much people that were come to the feast, that's Passover, when they heard that Jesus was coming to Jerusalem, took branches of palm trees, Palm Sunday, and went forth to meet him, and cried, Hosanna, blessed is the king of Israel that cometh in the name of the Lord. And Jesus, when he had found a young ass, sat thereon, as it is written, Fear not, daughter of Zion. Behold, thy king cometh, sitting on an ass's colt. These things understood not his disciples at the first. But when Jesus was glorified, then remembered they that these things were written of him, and that they had done these things unto him. So, all four gospel records are reporting this Palm Sunday entrance into Jerusalem. Back to Luke. Back to Luke 19. We will recall, I had told you, back, well, we can flip to it, chapter 9 of Luke. Chapter 9, Luke 9. The Mount of Transfiguration, which was approximately six months prior, in the autumn or fall, Feast of Tabernacles, I estimate. Luke 9, Luke 9, remember this? Luke 9, verse 30. And behold, there talked with him two men, which were Moses and Elias, who appeared in glory and spake of his decease, which he should accomplish at Jerusalem. I've done this many times now. From Luke 9, 30 and 31, that emphasis there on Calvary and Jesus' decease, his departure, his exodus, his death to be accomplished at Jerusalem becomes more and more emphatic in Luke. The cross is mentioned more and more and more in Luke. Jerusalem is mentioned more and more in Luke. Luke 9, 51, 53. See, there he is going to Jerusalem for tabernacles. In the fall, you come over into chapter 13, 13, Luke 13, 13, 22, there, 
he's journeying toward Jerusalem. Journeying toward Jerusalem. If we come over to chapter 17, verse 11, Luke 17, verse 11, And it came to pass as he went to Jerusalem that he passed through the midst of Samaria and Galilee. Now, Tabernacles has already come and gone. He has already gone to Jerusalem for Tabernacles. He's left Jerusalem. And it says he's headed to Jerusalem again. He's in the region of Galilee and the region of Samaria here. This is his final trip to Jerusalem. He will go like this, like that, to Perea, Perea, east of the Jordan River. He will come westward to Jericho, cross the Jordan River, coming to Jericho, and he will approach Jerusalem for that last time from the east, like this. And we'll see that in these verses, here in chapter 19. Chapter 19. So, he has now arrived in Jerusalem. This is his last feast to celebrate in the city of the great king. Passover is less than a week away. And in our next lesson, uh, this study and the next study, they are companion videos. I will explain in our next study the calendar governing these events. The occurrences here are not random, haphazard, careless activities. There's a set time. The Lord Jesus Christ is aware of that time. And had Israel been walking by faith in her Old Testament scripture, she would be cognizant of that schedule too. And I'll tell you more about that in our next lesson. Luke 19, verse 28. And when he had thus spoken, he went before ascending up to Jerusalem. Earlier in chapter 19 of Luke, he was in Jericho. He's departed Jericho. He's ascending up to Jerusalem. In our last lesson, there was that Parable of the Ten Talents, the kingdom delayed, so on. He isn't going to Jerusalem to reign. He's going to die. Passover. The kingdom is not canceled, abrogated, nullified. It's just postponed. So with this map no longer needed, I can show you the other one that we bring out now. Here is the Palm Sunday map. So if you recall, before I removed the larger map, that general region that I was pointing to earlier. Here is a specific area within that larger map. So, if you've followed our studies thus far in Matthew and Mark, this isn't new to you. Jerusalem is this white area here, the city wall in black there. If you remember that map that I 
just removed, you notice here Jerusalem is here. North is to the top right. Notice that? So if you orient our last map would have been like this. Okay? North is straight up just like with the other map. But in this case I've tilted it. So we can accommodate more on this map. If you notice, let me <laughs> orient it like that again. Jericho is over here, way off to the top right. The Lord Jesus has come like this from Jericho. Bethany is here. Bethphage is here. The Mount of Olives is this large brown stripe. And the route he's taking on the donkey, the quote triumphal entry, this way toward the west. Approaching Jerusalem from the east. Here's Jerusalem. So the Lord Jesus did this. Okay? All right, now, getting back to Luke 19. We'll say more about this map in the upcoming lessons of Luke. Actually, that map will be with us for almost the rest of Luke now. We're winding down that gospel record. Look at Luke 19, 18 again. And when he had thus spoken, that, that parable of the ten talents, he went before ascending up to Jerusalem. Jerusalem is a higher elevation. So he's coming from down here. Okay, you can't really see way off the map here, way off your screen here. He's approaching Jerusalem and the mountains this way. Okay. He's ascending. Luke 19, 29. And it came to pass when he was come nigh to Beth Foggy. Beth Foggy, the house of figs. And Bethany, the house of dates. At the mount called the Mount of Olives, he sent two of his disciples. So getting back to the map once more, apparently the Lord Jesus Christ is here in Bethany. He's soon to ascend the Mount of Olives. So he ascends like this and he descends like that. There's the Kedron Valley between Jerusalem and the Mount of Olives. Luke 19, 29. When he was come nigh to Beth, Foggy and Bethany. So where is he? At the Mount called the Mount of Olives. Here's the Mount of Olives. Here's Bethany. Here's Beth, Foggy. Just a few miles from Jerusalem. Roughly what, two miles approximately, three kilometers? According to John eleven eighteen, Bethany is 15 furlongs, which is two miles, two miles, three kilometers. Bethphagi is halfway between Jerusalem and Bethany. The Lord Jesus Christ sends two of his disciples Go into the village over against you, in the which at your entering you shall find a colt tied, whereon yet never man sat. Loose him and bring him hither. And if any man ask you, why do you loose him? Thus shall ye say unto him, because the Lord hath need of him. And they that were sent went their way, and found even as he had said unto them. And as they were loosing the colt, 
The owners thereof said unto them, Why loose ye the colt? And they said, The Lord hath need of him. And they brought him to Jesus. And they cast their garments upon the colt, and they set Jesus thereon. Okay, that's Luke. Back to Matthew. Compare this to Matthew. If you paid attention, you'll notice you've noticed already there's a difference, a variation between Matthew and Mark and Luke and John. A lot of variations. Here's a striking one. Matthew 21, verse 1 again. And when they drew nigh unto Jerusalem and were come to Bethphage, under the Mount of Olives, then sent Jesus two disciples, saying unto them, Go into the village over against you, and straightway ye shall find an ass tied and a colt with her. Loose them, and bring them unto me. And if any man say aught unto you, ye shall say, The Lord hath need of them, and straightway he will send them. If you come down to verse, and keep reading in 4, All this was done that it might be fulfilled, which was spoken by the prophet, saying, Tell ye the daughter of Zion, Behold, thy king cometh unto thee, meek, and sitting upon an ass, and a colt the foal of an ass. And the disciples went and did as Jesus commanded them. And they, what? They brought the ass and the colt, and put on them their clothes, and they set him thereon. Come over to Mark again. Mark 11, 1. And when they came nigh to Jerusalem, unto Bethphage and Bethany, at the Mount of Olives, he sendeth forth two of his disciples. And saith unto them, Go your way into the village over against you, and as soon as ye be entered into it, ye shall find a colt tie, whereon never man sat. Loose him, and bring him. And if any man say unto you, Why do ye this? Say ye that the Lord hath need of him. And straightway he will send him hither. And they went their way, and found the colt tied by the door without, in a place where two ways met, and they loose him. And certain of them that stood there said unto them, What do ye, loosing the colt? And they said unto them, Even as Jesus had commanded. And they let them go. And they brought the colt to Jesus and cast their garments on him. And he sat upon him. John. Turn to John. John. John 12. Verse 12, On the next day, much people that were come to the feast, when they heard that Jesus was coming to Jerusalem, took branches of palm trees and went forth to meet him, and cried, Hosanna, blessed is the king of Israel that cometh in the name of the Lord. And Jesus, when he had found a young ass, sat thereon as it is written, Fear not, daughter of Zion, behold, thy king cometh, sitting on an ass's colt. Only Matthew relates to us the fact the mare or the mother donkey was acquired too. Mark, Luke, and John focus on the colt, the foal, the young donkey. The Lord Jesus Christ, according to Matthew, required the mother, the mare, and the baby donkey. You notice how the four gospel records are different from each other? And they're meant to be like that. The Holy Spirit did that deliberately. So, if we simply read Mark, or Luke, or John... Without comparing it to Matthew, see what we lose? That's why it's ever so critical that we study the Bible. We compare verses with each other. It's not enough. It's not enough to merely read one verse a day and say, I've done my duty. I read God's word. That is the lazy person's approach. I don't want to be mean, but I want to be frank. The, the reason why there is so much deception 
and people confused and ignorant of Scripture is, that's because they've chosen to be like that. I used to be in the same position. My denomination had caused me to be a Bible baby, immature in the Word of God. And it wasn't God's fault, it was mine. Okay. Many, many years back, I made the choice. I will not be a Bible baby. I will be a mature saint. And all those years of ignorance, I was a member of the church, the body of Christ, but oh, how I was so ignorant of Scripture. But I knew denominational doctrine backward and forward. I've forsaken that. I don't miss that immaturity at all. Childishness. Luke 19, Luke 19, verse 29 again. He's come nigh to Bethphage. It's spring, it's Passover. He knows he's going to Jerusalem to die. He's told us that in Luke 18. He's told his disciples that, his apostles, Luke 18, 31 to 34. He's at the mount called the Mount of Olives. The Mount of Olives. Also called Mount Olivet. The Mount of Olives plays an important role in the Bible for several reasons. Now that the Lord Jesus Christ's earthly ministry is coming to a close. Only a week left. Less than a week left. Luke 19, 29. The Mount called the Mount of Olives. In chapter 21, the Lord Jesus will sit on the Mount of Olives. And he will deliver his Olivet Discourse, his end times sermon. We'll teach that when we get to it. Luke 21. On the night of his betrayal and arrest, just before Judas Iscariot turns him over to the apostate religious leaders of Israel, the Lord Jesus will pray here. On the Mount of Olives. Chapter 24 of Luke. Acts 1 of Luke. He will ascend. After his resurrection. He will ascend his father's right hand. From the Mount of Olives. Also. The Mount of Olives. Is the place to which he will return. At his second coming. Zechariah 14. We'll look at that later. We'll say more about his second coming. To the Mount of Olives in chapter 21. The Olivet Discourse. Luke 19. Verse. 29. At the mount called the Mount of Olives, he sent two of his disciples. The Bible doesn't name them. So, no reason to speculate who they are anyway. Saying, Go ye into the village over against you. Now, if he's come nigh to Bethphage and Bethany, of course they would reach Bethany first, then Bethphage. Apparently, he sends these two disciples, like I had said earlier. He must send them to Bethphage to get the donkey and its mother and bring them back to Bethany so he can go this way 
and enter Jerusalem from the east. So if we come now to Luke 19, 30, Go ye into the village over against you, in the which as you're entering, ye shall find a colt tied, whereon yet never man sat. Loose him and bring him hither. And if any man ask you, why do ye loose him? Thus shall ye say unto him, because the Lord hath need of him. If you come over to Verse 32, And they that were sent went their way, and found even as he had said unto them. The Lord Jesus foresaw what was there. And as they were loosing the colt, the owners thereof said unto them, Why loose ye the colt? And they said, The Lord hath need of him. Don't see that in Matthew. Only Mark and Luke report. They were asked, why are you loosing the colt? If you come over to Matthew again, come over to Matthew 21. Matthew 21, verse 4. All this was done that it might be fulfilled, which was spoken by the prophet, saying, Tell ye the daughter of Zion, Behold, thy king cometh unto thee. Meek and sitting upon an ass, and a colt the foal of an ass. John, John 12, John chapter 12, John 12, 14. And Jesus, when he had found a young ass, sat thereon, as it is written, Fear not, daughter of Zion, behold, thy king cometh, sitting on an ass's colt. Christ knows he must fulfill Bible prophecy. In Luke 19, we aren't told, but in Matthew and John, we are. Prophecy is being fulfilled here. Book of Zechariah, chapter 9. Zechariah 9, verse 9. This was approximately 500 years prior. The Holy Spirit, through the prophet Zechariah, saw the two comings of Christ. Now, he didn't see them separated, but we can see them separate and distinct now with a completed Bible. Zechariah 9. Zechariah 9, verse 9. Rejoice greatly, O daughter of Zion. Shout, O daughter of Jerusalem. Behold, thy king cometh unto thee. He is just and having salvation, lowly, and riding upon an ass, and upon a colt the foal of an ass. When your king arrives, Zion, when your king comes to you, Jerusalem, you will know it. He will mount a donkey and he will come visit you. You'll know him when you see him. Isn't that simple, plain? Zechariah 9. Rejoice. Greatly, verse 9, O daughter of Zion, shout, O daughter of Jerusalem, behold, look, thy king cometh unto thee. He is just, he's righteous, he has, he has salvation. He's lowly, he rides upon an ass and upon a colt, the foal of an ass. Don't get confused here. The Lord Jesus rode one animal. It can be called a foal. It can be called a colt. It can be called the foal of an ass. The ass is the mother there. The, the foal, the young of the ass, the, the mare. The Lord Jesus rode one 
donkey, the baby donkey, the young donkey. Yeah. We don't need to get mixed up here like you know scholarly minded people have. The Lord Jesus is meek. He's meek. He's lowly. Lowly and meek. If you come back to Matthew 21, 5, lowly in Zechariah is interpreted as meek. Meek. He's gentle. He's mild. He's lowly. There's nothing at this time anything triumphant about his arrival in Jerusalem is there. These are humble circumstances. Here is the mighty king of Israel. He's on a donkey. A baby donkey. He's meek, he's lowly. No angelic chorus. No wrath. No throne, huh? This is his meek and lowly coming. Meek and lowly. And if my timeline were visible, you'd see my first coming is meek and lowly. I'm not here to pour out wrath. Meek and lowly, the donkey, the donkey. In these times, ancient times here, when a king was entering a city, if he desired peace with that area, he rode a donkey. Christ Jesus has come to his city, his capital city, David's former capital city, King David. Here is this son of David going into Jerusalem humbly, meekly, lowly. Luke 9, remember? Luke 9, Luke 9, when the Samaritans refused to receive him months earlier, James and John asked if they could call down fire from heaven to consume these unbelievers as Elias had done centuries ago. Luke 9, 55, but he turned and rebuked them and said, Ye know not what manner of spirit ye are of, for the Son of Man is not come to destroy men's lives, but to save them. My first coming is not to judge sinners, to pour out my wrath, take vengeance. No. 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 I referred to this earlier. We can look at it now. You come back to Zechariah 14. Zechariah 14. Zechariah 14, verse 1. Behold, the day of the Lord cometh, and thy spoil shall be divided in the midst of thee, for I will gather all nations against Jerusalem. The battle here is the battle of Armageddon. Valley of Megiddo and Eshtron. And the city shall be taken, Jerusalem, and the houses rifled, and the women ravished, 
And half of the city shall go forth into captivity, and the residue of the people shall not be cut off from the city. Then shall the Lord go forth and fight against those nations as when he fought in the day of battle. And his feet shall stand in that day upon the Mount of Olives, which is before Jerusalem on the east. And the Mount of Olives shall cleave in the midst thereof toward the east and toward the west. And there shall be a very great valley, and half of the mountain shall remove toward the north, and half of it toward the south. Come over to Revelation 19. Zechariah 14 is his return, his second coming. Look at Revelation 19. Revelation 19, verse 11. And I saw heaven opened, and behold, a white horse. And he that sat upon him was called Faithful and True, and in righteousness he doth judge and make war. His eyes were as a flame of fire, and on his head were many crowns, and he had a name written that no man knew but he himself. And he was clothed with a vesture dipped in blood, and his name is called the Word of God. In the ancient times of the Bible there, when a king was to make war with a city, he rode a horse to meet it. So here at the Palm Sunday entrance, erroneously called the triumphal entry, no, there's no triumph here in Luke 19. It says meek and lowly coming. Meek and lowly on the donkey. I desire peace. I'm not here to judge. I'm here to save. Israel has a sin problem. But remember, Israel in unbelief says, Who, we? We don't have a sin problem. We have our works religion. We aren't that bad. Actually, we're sinless. All these others around us, they're sinners, the publicans, the harlots. Luke 19. Luke 19. He's on the donkey. The meek and lowly coming. They will not receive him. We know that already. We haven't even gotten to his trials. We haven't gotten to his crucifixion yet, but we know they've rejected him. We've seen the hints now, these last three years of earthly ministry. They don't want him. He will soon die. They will murder him. He will take his life. They will formally deny him before the Gentiles. Alright, he goes away, remember, after his resurrection. As a royal exile, he goes to his father's right hand. According to Zechariah and Acts 1 and Revelation 19, he returns to the Mount of Olives. The first place his feet touch when he comes back is the Mount of Olives. He's not on a donkey when he returns, is he? He's on a white horse. Judge and make war. So his second coming, look at this, Matthew 25, Matthew 25, Matthew 25, Matthew 25, 31. When the Son of Man shall come in His glory and all the holy angels with Him, then shall He sit upon the throne of His glory. My second coming, that is the triumphal entry. The power and the great glory that 
accompany when I return. The second coming is his triumphal entry. The power and great glory coming. We aren't there yet. It's been 2,000 years. The world still awaits the real triumphal entry. Eventually, in the Lord's time, it will transpire. Just not in our dispensation. Not right now. Not as the mystery program operates. No. Prophecy is on hold. They found the donkey. They bring the mother and the baby donkey to the Lord Jesus. Exactly as the Lord told them, that's how they found the donkey. You come over to Luke 19.30. You find the cult tied. The colt is in bondage, isn't it? Untie the colt. Bring the colt here. Loose the colt. We're on yet never man set. He's wild, isn't he? A donkey is well known for its stubbornness, its willfulness. It refuses to cooperate. What a perfect picture of sinful Israel, huh? Sinful man. Job 11. Job 11. Job. The book of Job, chapter 11. Job 11, 12. For vain man would be wise. Though man be born like a wild ass's colt. Man is stubborn. He refuses to do his creator's will. The Lord Jesus Christ, he's come to Israel who refuses to do his father's will. They're in bondage to the law, to the evil world system. They can't be controlled. They're tied up wild there. The word of the Lord goes forth, bring the donkey to me. I'll tame it. The Lord hath need of him. Israel can't be subdued except the Lord do it for her. And he causes that young donkey to behave and serve him. The Lord hath need of him. Verse 34. The Lord has need of him. Verse 31. Because the Lord has need of him. Verse 34. The Lord hath need of him. The Lord has a purpose for Israel. Has a purpose for man. But sin complicates those situations. Loose Israel from that bondage to sin. I'll make her do my will. And the baby donkey with the mother donkey ahead to lead. Jesus sits on the baby donkey and rides it into Jerusalem. That is a picture of Israel's kingdom restoration. Again. But there's no restoration now. It's a picture or a type. What will happen even beyond our day? A long time from 81st century. Verse 34. And they said, the Lord hath need of him. I'm going to read this to you. Luke 19, 34. The Lord hath need of him. 
earlier, I warned you about taking verses out of context, looking for passages that we like and seizing them, not really understanding their dispensational context, just ripping verses from contexts, and doing what we want to do because our church endorses that behavior. In chapter 18 of Luke, I explained you shouldn't take with God all things are possible from that context. With God all things are possible. Luke 18 27, the things which are impossible with men are possible with God. That has a context. Okay? The context is man cannot save himself, but man can rely on God, and God can save man. Well, here's another example of ripping verses from contexts and forcing the Bible to say what we want it to say. So let me read this to you. Let me read this verse again. Luke 19, 34. And they said, The Lord hath need of him. Okay, ready? I watched in horror a couple of years ago as a guest on a charismatic television network explained the, quote, biblical basis of his ministry of possibility thinking. <laughs> my ministry is based entirely on my life verse. Matthew 19, 26. With God, all things are possible. Remember that? God gave me that verse because I was born in 1926. Obviously intrigued by that method of obtaining a life verse, the talk show host grabbed the Bible and began thumbing through excitedly. I was born in 1934, he said. My life verse would be Matthew 19, 34. What does it say? Then he discovered that Matthew 19 has only 30 verses. <laughs> Undeterred, he flipped to Luke 19 and read verse 34. And they said, the Lord hath need of him. <laughs> Thrilled, he exclaimed, oh, the Lord has need of me. The Lord has need of me. What a wonderful life verse. I've never had a life verse before, but now the Lord has given me one. Thank you, Jesus. Hallelujah. The studio audience began to applause. At that moment, however, the talk show host's wife, who had also turned to Luke 19, said, Wait a minute! You can't use this. This verse is talking about a donkey. <laughs> I say that with Luke 19, 34 again, and they said the Lord hath need of him. Don't rip verses from their contexts. Be sure you see them in context and quote them in context. If we don't use the Bible verses, in their settings, we teach lies. It's not simply the charismatics, you know, the spiritual gift, Holy Ghost, tongue speaking, miracle healing people that take verses from the Bible and make a mess with them. It's all denominations. Okay. That haphazard Bible quoting. I like that verse, remember? 
I don't like that verse. Leave that one alone. I don't want that next verse either. Now, the, the following verse, give me that one. That's what I want to do. Throw that out. Uh-uh. Don't follow that. Mistranslation, poor translation. Not in the original manuscripts. Throw that out. <laughs> See how denominations form? Yeah. Luke 19, verse 34. They said, The Lord hath need of him. Who's the him? It's the donkey. It's not a talk show host preacher in America in the 20th century <laughs> or the 21st century. They said, the Lord hath need of him. The Lord has a purpose, a plan for the donkey. That's Israel symbolized. Verse 35, Luke 19, 35. And they brought him to Jesus. Now, remember, the mare, the mother, is with the baby donkey, according to Matthew. They brought him to Jesus, and they cast their garments upon the colt, Luke 19, 35. And they set Jesus thereon, on the colt. See? They made a, is a makeshift saddle with clothes. And Jesus rides the donkey, verse 36. And as he went, they spread their clothes in the way. Back to Matthew 21, verse 7. And they brought the ass and the colt, the mother and the baby, and put on them their clothes, and they set him thereon, on the baby donkey. And a very great multitude spread their garments in the way. Others cut down branches from the trees and strawed them in the way. And the multitudes that went before and that followed cried, saying, Hosanna to the son of David. Blessed is he that cometh in the name of the Lord. Hosanna in the highest. Now Mark. Mark 11. Mark 11. Verse 7. And they brought the colt to Jesus and cast their garments on him and he sat upon him and many spread their garments in the way and others cut down branches off the trees and strawed them in the way and they that went before and they that followed cried saying Hosanna blessed is he that cometh in the name of the Lord blessed be the kingdom of our father David that cometh in the name of the Lord Hosanna in the highest if you come over to John John 12, John 12, once more. John 12, 12. On the next day, much people that were come to the feast, when they heard that Jesus was coming to Jerusalem, took branches of palm trees. It's Palm Sunday. It's exactly one week before his resurrection. And went forth to meet him and cried, Hosanna, blessed is the king of Israel that cometh in the name of the Lord. And when, and Jesus, when he had found a young ass, sat thereon as it is written. Luke 19, Luke 19, 36. And as he went, they spread their clothes in the way. They're spreading palm branches. They're spreading garments on the path, the, the road. See here? He's approaching Jerusalem from the east. He's making his way down this path. No more than two miles, three kilometers. Bethany to Bethphage. He ascends the Mount of Olives here, see? Higher elevation. He gets to the apex, the peak. Then he descends, he goes down the side of the Mount of Olives, down into the Kidron Valley, and then to Jerusalem here. Okay. That is the Palm Sunday entrance of the Lord Jesus Christ into Jerusalem. Riding the donkey. Okay. Now, 
like I told you in our next lesson, I will teach you about the schedule governing these events, Daniel's 70 weeks, the Passion Week timeline, and the significance of this last week prophetically of Christ's ministry before he dies. Look at Luke 19, 37. And when he was come nigh, even now at the descent of the Mount of Olives, the whole multitude of the disciples began to rejoice and praise God with a loud voice for all the mighty works that they had seen, saying, Blessed be the King, Luke 19, 38, that cometh in the name of the Lord, peace in heaven and glory in the highest. They're singing. They are shouting, aren't they? They're rejoicing. They're praising God. The whole multitude of the disciples They see the Lord Jesus Christ is their king. Now again, remember, it's not he's coming to set up a kingdom now. He's not to reign now. But he is presenting himself as their king. Behold, thy king cometh. Had they been walking by faith in their Old Testament scriptures, all of Israel would have been here singing and rejoicing and praising God. Prophecy is being fulfilled. Matthew 21, again, verse 9. And the multitudes that went before and that followed, they're ahead of him and they're behind him, cried, Hosanna to the son of David. He's the son of David, huh? The king, the king. Blessed is he that cometh in the name of the Lord. Hosanna in the highest. Mark, Mark 11, 9. And they that went before, and they that followed, cried, saying, Hosanna! Blessed is he that cometh in the name of the Lord. Blessed be the kingdom of our father David, that cometh in the name of the Lord. Hosanna in the highest. Blessed be the king that cometh in the name of the Lord. John 12. John 12, 13. They took branches of palm trees and went forth to meet him and cried, Hosanna, blessed is the king of Israel that cometh in the name of the Lord. That is a quotation of Psalm 118. Psalm 118. We can turn to Psalm 118. Psalm 118, Psalm 118, the stone which the builders refused is become the headstone of the corner. This is the Lord's doing and is marvelous in our eyes. This is the day which the Lord hath made. We will rejoice and be glad in it. Save now, I beseech thee, O Lord, O Lord, I beseech thee, send now prosperity. Blessed be he that cometh in the name of the Lord. We have blessed you out of the house of the Lord. Psalm 118 is partially fulfilled on Palm Sunday. Hosanna, save. The Hebrew word, Hosanna, means save. See? Psalm 118, 
25, save now. Hosanna! You're our Savior. Savior. Save. Remember in Zechariah 9, He has salvation. Our King, our Messiah, has salvation. He's come to save us, deliver us. Not simply from Rome and all those other Gentile world empires, but also from our sins. Okay? Only a few in Israel can see that, want to see it. They're content in their blindness and darkness. Blessed be the King that cometh in the name of the Lord. Peace in heaven and glory in the highest. Praising God, they're rejoicing. Verse 39. And some of the Pharisees from among the multitude said unto him, Master, rebuke thy disciples. Tell them to stop this. Those Pharisees, they don't like the Lord Jesus Christ at the center of attention. They likely fear the Roman government will intervene here and accuse him of treason. Our whole nation is on the verge of displeasing the Roman Emperor. If he hears people in Jerusalem crying out, Your king, and he isn't the Roman Emperor, Tiberius Caesar is not king, all oh, There'll be trouble here in Jerusalem. Tell your disciples to stop this. Quit calling him the king that comes in the name of the Lord. The Pharisees are unbelieving. They're not rejoicing. They're not praising God. See the willful ignorance. Luke 19.40 And he answered and said unto them, I tell you that if these should hold their peace, the stones would immediately cry out. If you want my disciples to shut up, if they were to close their mouths, then you know the rest of creation, the inanimate, non-living parts of creation, they would cry out instead. The stones would immediately cry out if people didn't praise God here. Now, if we are intelligent beings, rational beings, And we don't have enough sense to appreciate the Creator, our Creator. Then the rest of creation that isn't even alive, even they would ha have the ability to praise God if we didn't. See, it, how foolish it is of man to believe that he is so superior to faith in the God of creation. Oh, I'm not superstitious. I don't hold to fairy tales. I believe in science. I believe in logic. I believe in reason. 
I don't follow the Bible. A book of Jewish fables, myths. That comes from someone who has either been burned, disappointed because of hypocrisy and other silliness they've seen in church circles, and or they haven't actually researched the Bible, and it's just easier to, to dismiss it. How much have the Bible critics actually studied of the Bible before they comment on it? From what I have seen through the years, very little to none. Here, these Pharisees, they have the Hebrew Bible, they have the Old Testament Scripture, there's evidence, there's proof, isn't there? Jesus of Nazareth is, without a doubt, he is our king. He is the son of David. He is the son of God. He is our Messiah. He is our Christ. He is God's anointed. No question, no doubt about it. There's proof. He's fulfilled the messianic prophecies there. Zechariah 9, Psalm 118. But in Israel, Look at this. Look at this. Oh! How absurd. Matthew 21, verse 10. And when he was coming to Jerusalem, all the city was moved, saying, Who is this? Verse 11, and the multitude said, this is Jesus, the prophet of Nazareth of Galilee. Well, partly right. But he's more than simply the prophet of Nazareth of Galilee. He's the son of God. He's the son of David. Not just any ordinary prophet. He's Jehovah God in human flesh. And he's come into his city. Fulfilling Bible prophecy. <laughs> and his city looks at him and says, Who's this? Who is this? They haven't believed their Hebrew Bible. And it shows, doesn't it? Oh, it does. It does. They've turned a blind eye to these prophecies fulfilled? They've turned a deaf ear to these prophecies fulfilled? They've decided they don't want to believe the proof, the evidence. Yeah, we see. We don't care though. Yeah, we hear. Just don't care. The blindest person is the one who refuses to see. The deafest person is the one who refuses to hear. And that, sadly, is a good many souls in Israel. Even today, around the world, Jew and Gentile alike, The willful ignorance. So watch. In our next lesson, we're finishing early. You're welcome. <laughs> In our next study, we will read the rest of Luke 19. We will expound it. Watch how the Lord Jesus replies to how Jerusalem receives him. 
That will be in our next lesson. It's a believing remnant. But it's a remnant. They don't recognize him corporately as a nation. There's blindness. Not thinking like God's nation. And now that God's son is there with them, hmm? who's that? <laughs> we don't know. They will not receive me. I'm not reigning. I'm dying here. Watch. As this final week of Christ's life unfolds. The Passion Week. He's in Jerusalem. He's in the vicinity of Jerusalem. And he will stay here. For the next week, from his entry into Jerusalem to his resurrection, he's in that vicinity. What he's doing there, why he's there, the prophetic significance, we'll get to that in our next lesson to some degree. <laughs> so this is part one, and I'll deal with part two Next lesson, the calendar on which Christ is working, conducting his life. That Palm Sunday entrance, so-called triumphal entry, there's a tie-in to Daniel and Exodus. We'll look at that next time. Okay. Father God, thank you for this time of study and for the edification that you've given us here and the enlightenment. In Christ's name, amen. So one more lesson in Luke 19. That's up next.